Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me on the show, Kelvin Cheng from ISIS Malaysia, as well as Dr. Kenneth Simla from the World Bank Global Knowledge and Research Hub. We're talking about Bantuan Sarah Hidok. And, you know, there's been a lot of conversation uh, these past few days about poverty and the, um, I guess, the 0.4% uh, poverty rate here in Malaysia. This was after the UN Special Rapporteur came to town and uh, created quite a stir. Now, I wanted one of the things that came out from that that really interested me was a focus on the multi-dimensional poverty index that was introduced as a poverty measurement in the 11th Malaysia Plan. Now, can could you help us under, get a better understanding about what that multi-dimensional poverty index is? Sure thing. It's something that has been uh, gaining in popularity across the world. The World Development Report in 2010, put up by the UN, mm -hmm. introduced a systematic approach to multi-dimensional poverty measurement. And what it is, it, the one in Malaysia, um, and also one that the World Bank uses, recognizes monetary income as one aspect of poverty, but also other non-monetary aspects of well-being that should be considered. Uh, one that's usually used and is used in Malaysia is education, is access to education, number of years of school completed. Another is has to do with health, with access to clean drinking water and, and, and good sanitation. And another is uh, living quarters in good condition. Okay. So it's recognized that people might have enough money to be above the poverty line, the monetary poverty line, but might be deprived in other areas. Okay. And that this is also important for well-being and, and that that will uh, shape, that should shape policy. All right, so when we th we're thinking about social protection programs, uh, the government is viewing it through this multi-dimensional poverty lens, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, Calvin, what do you think about the social protection programs that we have uh, currently? Do you think that they're targeting the right people? Well, uh, first, of, first off, I'd like to say that, um, you know, it's well known that uh, social assistance programs in Malaysia are very fragmented. They are administered by many different ministries, many different agencies. How many? Do we know? Oh, we don't even... <laughs> I, 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 I don't have the exact numbers. I'm uh, okay. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Perhaps it's every ministry has, has some kind of program, right? It seems that way. Close to <laughs> it. So, um, so, yeah, I think that, that, that definitely hampers uh, efforts at targeting, uh, especially since there is a little coordination between the ministries, between the agencies, and often um, there's a variety of different kinds of uh, assistance that sort of overlap, right? They sort of um, almost um, duplicate each other. Right. So, so targeting the same people, perhaps, you know, there's, there's overlap there, is it? Absolutely, okay. yeah. And even if we're talking specifically about BRIM, um, or BSH rather, um, we do see uh, like targeting errors, exclusion and inclusion errors that are, that are somewhat um, significant, mm. I would say. I in what way? Well, um, I, for example, uh, exclusion errors, so under coverage. So um, there are poor households which meet the income eligibility requirements, um, but they don't receive BRIM, uh, BSH. Um, and that could be a targeting problem. It could be an information problem. Mm -hmm. It could be that applying for BSH um, is, you know, they don't know how to apply. It, uh, or it could be also be the fact that, um, as Ken mentioned, um, their household size does not uh, tie in with the eligibility requirements, right? So they could be a very large household, but they, they earn more than the 4,000 threshold and they do not receive these benefits. Right, because yeah. with if the current Bantuan Sarah Hido, uh, households with a monthly income of s more than 4,000, so if you earn 4,001 ringgit a month, mm -hmm. even if you have you know, 10 children, you're still not eligible for that. That's right. Okay. That's, that's right. And that's, I, I think, um, so as far as our targeting the right people, I'd say, Almost, all right. But, but by using this income per household threshold, whether it's the four thousand in or out of brim, or the the three thousand and two thousand cutoffs that determine how much benefit you get, it could be improved by taking into account household size. Okay, okay. how many people is that? Is that two thousand or three thousand or four thousand ringgit per month providing for? I see. And that's a fairly simple uh, change to the system that, that would improve the targeting. So, you know, there was also a debate that was happening after the UN Special Rapporteur was, you know, um, talking not just about the measure of poverty, but also whether, you know, the assistance that the government is tar targeting the B40, that's 40%, right, of the entire population of Malaysia, whether that is specific enough. Should we be looking at such a breadth of social protection 
versus a depth where you're targeting perhaps the ones who really need it the most? Uh, that's a great point. And mm -hmm. I, think, I, I think that it, it could be targeted better to the B20 or B15. Mm -hmm. Um, B40 is, is, you know, it's close to half the population. Correct. Yeah. And because of that, uh, people have the sense maybe that a lot is spent is a bantu and but that's because it's going to a lot of people. The actual amount of benefit per household is quite small by world standards, and, and our analysis shows that it doesn't have that much impact on their, on their incomes. If you could focus now, lower income households, do those below 2,000 get more than those below 3,000. So there's some of that mm -hmm. progressivity in there, but it's very limited. Okay. And, and Calvin, do you have anything to add to that? Absolutely. I think um, as well as um, talking about breadth, right? So obviously the households in the B10 or the B20 have certainly different needs than households in the B40 and they would require different kinds of assistance um, as compared to households in the B40, mm. right? Um, so and I think if you look at a BSH, it's one of the most widely targeted cash transfer programs um, compared in comparison to other international cash transfer programs in the world. Right, so uh, currently the targeting moves all the way up, um, even breaching the B40 threshold to, to reaching some of that lower M40 level, um, whereas most um, cash transfer programs around the world target quite narrowly around the poverty line. Is, so should we be looking at narrowing the, the target? Should we be looking at focusing on that? Because you know, while, while I think a lot of people in the B40 I guess are happy with the, the cash transfer and it does go some ways in helping them, should we be looking at spending that money? Should the government be looking at spending that money differently? Mm -hmm. So, could spend it differently? I think also that the call has to be made for spending more. Spending, uh, more. spending more. Spending more. Right. Um, our, our work is showing what we, we call adequacy. The, uh, the, the percentage of uh, the, the benefit from BSH as a percentage of, of recipients' income is about 5%, mm -hmm. so, so it's quite small. Now you can keep it hitting the B40 and then increase the amounts for the lower end. Wow. You can scale it down. So both spending smarter, but also I think spending more. Okay. We, uh, okay, spending smarter and spending more. We're gonna come back and talk more about Bantuan Sarah Hidup. Make sure you stay tuned to consider this. <laughs>